I'm Nate Tonemaker. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, my sobriety date is August 15th, 2011. I'm really short and this microphone is right in my eyesight. Uh, I'm going to move around. Well, I'm, I'm going to move anyway, so it's not a big deal. I can't stand still to save my life, uh, period. And I've, I've never really had a hard time speaking loud uh, or being kind of, I guess, the center of attention in, in terms of a lot of situations. And, I'm working on it, uh, is all I can say to that. Uh, I, have a, I have a sponsor uh, who has a sponsor, and, and I have the ability to sponsor other men now too, which I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for. Uh, it has uh, changed my life in the way that, that uh, I perceive a whole lot that happens uh, personally, uh, just, just based on, on being able to be there for, for other men as they walk through uh, experiences in their life. Um, and uh, I have a home group. It's the New Inner City group. We meet in downtown Raleigh. I don't know what the address is, but I know where it is. Uh, it's uh, at the corner. It's at the church. It's called Hillier Memorial Church. Uh, we meet in the basement. And um, it's at the corner of St. Mary's and Hillsborough Street. Um, we meet every Thursday night at 8 o'clock. We have a, a step study on the first Thursday, a tradition uh, meeting on the second, and uh, a discussion meeting on AA approved literature on the third. And if, on the fourth, we have a speaker. And if there's a fifth, there's a workshop. So we're busy, uh, which is good. Uh, idle time for me has never been a good thing. Um, and I also get real bored if I hear the same thing over and over again. Um, but having said that, I, uh, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I think that for myself, I'm really stubborn and I don't listen. Uh, and, and hearing the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, which for myself was that there was some hope that somebody who was like me and uh, couldn't do anything right, not only with my drinking and a whole bunch of other stuff, but just in general in life, could walk into a room uh, of people, whether I knew anybody or I knew everybody in that room and feel at home, uh, and that there would be a solution that would allow me to solve anything that might happen in my life, um, or at least allow me to walk through it as, as dignified as I could. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, it absolutely 100% has saved my life and given me so many opportunities that I just would have never, ever had had I not come in here and just finally told somebody that I, I didn't know what to do anymore and I needed some help. Um, I, uh, I like speaking, um, one, because I like to hear myself talk sometimes, and two, just because, I mean, I, I think it's kind of fun, but I, like recently, I used to not get all that nervous, and I wasn't real nervous at all today until about five minutes ago, and I'm real nervous right now, so I apologize if I jump over a little bit or all around, um, but I got real nervous, and, uh, and I really appreciate the nice things that you said about me, um, you know, there, that, that meant a lot, and, and that particular uh, week was, was, a, was a very challenging week for me, and, and I'll talk about that, well, I'll, I guess now is as good a time as any. Um, I, on, on Thanksgiving, so I, I've had a lot of loss in my life recently this year uh, of people that meant a whole lot to me. Um, and I lost my grandmother uh, in, uh, in April uh, of last year. And she was kind of the rock of the family. She also was the one person that never gave up on me. I have no idea why, because I did not treat her the way that somebody should treat uh, a grandmother and, or just really anybody uh, in terms of that. And, and um, but she never gave up on me. And when I lost her, that broke my heart. Now, I got a chance to spend several years with her sober, which was wonderful. And I got a chance to make those amends and to be a part of her life when she wanted me to be there, which is really all she wanted from the very beginning. Um, and, and so my birthday is right around Thanksgiving. And, and uh, we used to always spend it at her house. And so it's just a, it's a real special time in my family. But obviously she wasn't there uh, this Thanksgiving, but we had my whole dad's side of the family in. Um, and uh, at about 12 o'clock that afternoon, we were out there playing cards and gambling like we always do. And uh, my, neighbor's, um, my neighbor's mom came in and knocked on the door and she was frantic. And she, uh, my, my mother answered the door and um, she, just, she just collapsed. And uh, her son had overdosed in the house um, about probably a day, day and a half before that, and, and she had come to pick him up for Thanksgiving dinner um, and, uh, and didn't know what to do, and she was just frantic. Uh, so I spent that afternoon holding her because uh, she had just lost her baby boy and trying to work through that whole situation with, with her and, and the police and everything because it, 
we thought it was a crime scene and it was just a, a whole jumbled mess. And, and my home group is on Thursday. So, you know, I, I was taught a long time ago and I've always felt this way that when, when I ever have anything going on in my life, good, bad, or indifferent, AA is always there for me, period. Um, and, and so I could not wait to go to my home group after that happened. Um, and I, I got there real early. I set up and I just kind of sat there and I was all by myself, but I was at home because I was in AA and I knew there would be some people that would show up soon that I could talk to or at least just sit there and listen to them because maybe that would help with what had just happened. Um, and then the next week I, I got a chance to come down to the prison and, and it was phenomenal. Um, it, it really, like I, I had to do so much more this past year than I've had to do really since even more than I got than it was when I first got sober because it just... I've had a lot of uh, challenging things that have happened to me and it really sucks, but it's, it's okay. You know, uh, it really is. Um, being there for somebody else and getting a chance to share that stuff and let that give somebody else a little bit of hope if that is what they're looking for, or at least to just know that they may not be alone um, in their struggles is, is, is a miracle. Um, and it's something that my sponsor taught me to do from the very beginning. Uh, and, uh, and I'm forever grateful for, for him for that. And, so anyways, I'm going to kind of rewind a bit. Um, I, uh, I, I'm, ado I'm adopted. Uh, so I'm from Honduras originally. My mother is of Irish descent. And my father is of German descent. So I stick out in family photos a little bit, <laughs> uh, quite a bit, actually. Uh, my mom's side of the family is huge. And they're all real opinionative. Um, and they're all from northern Michigan. And it, it's an entertaining event. Whenever we all get together, it really is an event just because there's so many of us, we kind of take over the town. Uh, Rogers City is where the family reunion is every couple of years, and there's there's only a flashing yellow light in that town. Um, and there's one hotel, and we just rent the whole thing out, and, and there's a, a family farm there and stuff. And it's real fun, and there's some hunting camps spread out throughout the property and everything. And so as a kid, I got to see a lot of, there's alcoholism all over that family too. I mean, it's just it's everywhere. Um, again, makes for a very uh, entertaining time up there. So as a little kid, I would see every, like all the guys would go off to the, to the camps and they would get a chance to go drink and shoot guns and hopefully not shoot each other. Um, and all the women would go and do whatever it was that they did. And I would just kind of be left there with the kids. And eventually I would find a way to sneak off and, and find one of the camps. And, um, and, and I, I loved it. Like the idea of, of drinking and, uh, and shooting things and, just talking whatever it was that they were talking about was like the, the miracle of life to me. Uh, and, and I could not wait to be a part of it. Um, couldn't wait at all. And uh, I got, uh, man, I, I had my first drink in, in uh, between fifth and sixth grade. I had a buddy of mine who stole some beer from his dad and some uh, dip. And we went to the baseball field behind our house and we tried to do both of those things. And I got real sick and so did he. Uh, and I kept drinking and he stopped drinking and, and, um, and I really enjoyed it. You know, I mean, I loved it. I don't really remember what happened all that much other than the fact that I really liked it and I went home and I didn't have any consequences. It was fantastic. And I could not wait to do it again. Um, I mean, I was just, just over the moon about it. And being that it was elementary school and middle school, it wasn't all that easy to get alcohol, but it was still available every now and then. And so I would get drunk whenever I could and I would always get wasted. I don't understand controlled drinking. I don't understand, I don't, I just don't understand. I don't get it. Like it, it just doesn't, the, the concept of going to a bar or having one beer or even just 10 doesn't, like it doesn't click. I don't get it. Um, I, I, I like, reaching oblivion as fast as possible and as often as possible um you know and, and towards the end of my drinking if i could get drunk and pass out and you know like three times in a day like i thought that i had made it and that this was a pretty successful day um and uh and i mean it just ruled everything that i did um when i got into high school i got a job at a golf course i love golf i'm horrible at it but i love it um, and uh, the guys that I worked with were way older than I was, and uh, and they could they could buy me alcohol. And we did a whole lot of other things at that golf course too. This is Alcoholics Anonymous, so I won't talk about any of that. But I have done just about everything under the sun, and I've enjoyed every minute of all of it. So if anybody has experience with that stuff and would like to talk to me about it, I'd be happy to do so afterwards. Uh, but for now, I'll just talk about alcohol. And um, so when I 
could get stuff for the, from them for my buddies that I was growing up with, I, I became the cool kid. Um, and, and everybody wanted to hang out with me, or at least that's what I thought. That may not have been the case. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and I hear a lot of people talk about not being able to fit in. Um, I get that initially just because I don't look like my family, but that they never gave me a reason to feel like I was not a part of that family ever. I mean, they really didn't. Um, and I have been told many times that I just have a gift to be around people sometimes, you know, like I just fit into any environment and, uh, and, and find a way to be comfortable in that. And, and for the most part, I feel like that's pretty true, but you know, it, the, the idea of still being a part of or being a little bit better than somebody was very uh, attractive to me, uh, even having said that I really didn't have an issue with it, um, with, uh, in terms of feeling really left out. Uh, and so when I was in high school and doing that, I mean, I, I, we got drunk every weekend. I mean, it was fantastic. And, and uh, I know I've, I've heard a lot of people that talk about starting like one day and so on and so Like I would just full bore the whole time. Um, I pretty much stopped living with my parents in high school too, and I, would, I moved in with a buddy of mine because uh, his parents would let us do whatever we wanted to. Um, and the, my senior year in high school, I mean, we were drinking before class, we were drinking at lunch, and I was drinking afterwards. And normally I wouldn't really care about that except Woodshop was the first class, and that really wasn't a great idea in many situations. But, you know, like I had a lot of people that just would kind of help me along the way. I mean, my teacher, I'm, I'm almost, he never told me that he knew that I was drinking, but he would kind of look at me and my best friend who we were in the same, we were in that class together and we would both get drunk every, almost every morning. And we just kind of walk in there and he could tell if we were drinking and he would just point at one of us. And that was the one that we knew that was supposed to do the work for both of us that day while the other one slept it off. Um, and, you know, and then I would move into the next class and then we would go to lunch and I would get hammered and... I had one experience with my, my teacher coming back, uh, or for, like after lunch, where he, he, was a, a, he taught Vietnam and international relations. It was the coolest class. I mean, I, I loved that class. I have no idea why I enjoyed it so much, but I was really, really good at it. And uh, it was Christmas, Christmas time. He was handing out candy canes for people and they were going around and he's like, son, I think you should take like about a handful of these. So you might need it for later. And, and it clicked that he may I realized that, that I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing and he was really just trying to help me out because it was very obvious I wasn't going to change the way I was doing things. Um, you know, and, and I got arrested for the first time in high school as well. Uh, we went to spring break. I had a great time. I don't remember any of it uh, really except the mornings occasionally and, and I, I got arrested because I tried to run through a fence and it didn't work out very well. I got stuck. Um, I'm not very agile when I'm sober. I'm really not agile when I'm drunk, uh, especially as drunk as I like to get. I, I'm the happy-go-lucky guy, man. I will find the keg. I will have my, my case of beer with me, and I will find a place to sit, and I won't move, period. Uh, and then I'll wake up, and I will maybe go find somewhere else to go sit for a little bit more, and then I'll do that some more. Uh, you know, and, and so, like, running didn't work. I, so I, was, I thought I was doing the right thing. Like, we were, there was a group of us running away because the cops busted the party. And, and I'm, I'm making it with them. They're all really drunk, too. And there's this fence that's in the way. So I'm helping each one of them get over because I'm a nice guy. And then everybody's over and they all left. Man, I'm not getting over that thing. I mean, it wasn't that tall, but I mean, I'm not getting over it. And so I'm sitting there debating what I'm going to do. And I've decided that it would just be faster to try and run through it. And it <laughs> went horrible. Uh, it went really, really bad. So I ended up in jail that night. I had a great time. I got bailed out eventually. Um, you know, and I called my dad and he told me before I went down there, like, son, you got a drinking problem. Like, you really need to not go down, but we're going to let you go down anyways. Uh, but if you get arrested, you better not call me because uh, I'm not bailing you out. And so I called him and I was crying and I was, you know, I'm not going to do it again. I know it was terrible, but I was really excited about what had just happened. And, and um, you know, and, and he, he let me sit there like he told I found out this later that this, I found this out a couple years ago. When I got off the phone with him, he was on the phone with one of the one of the arresting officers. And he's like, "Just let him sit in there until about four thirty or five o'clock, and then just let him go." You know, make sure he's in his own cell so he's by himself because he's going to drive himself nuts. Which I did exactly the same thing. Like I, I'm when I'm left by myself, I'm in my head, and it is not good. Um, it is really not good at all. And uh, so I got out of there. I went. I kept doing my thing, and, and uh, I ended up coming home a little early because he wasn't real happy that he had to spend all that money to bail me out and um 
you know, I, I went to an alcohol assessment course for the court stuff and everything that went along with that. And, and the, the, the guy at that little place was, he made me take one of them tests and I tried real hard not to fail it. And I failed it with flying colors. It's, I am definitely an alcoholic. Um, and, uh, you know, he's like, man, you, you, you're in bad shape. I mean, I'm 18 years old and he's diagnosing me as a chronic alcoholic and the, the hospital's already done that before. And the police officers in Myrtle Beach have said the same thing now. And, and I, so normally folks might think like, maybe I should cut back a little bit. I was excited. You called me an alcoholic. That means I can continue to do what I want to do, which is get wasted all the time. Um, and if I don't live that long, I'm okay with it. Cause I'm, I mean, what else, I mean, how, how long are you gonna be able to do this? You know, like I was somewhat logical about that kind of stuff. Um, the idea of dying at 21 or 25 was acceptable to me, uh, just as long as I got to, to drink and have fun in the meantime. Um, and so I was off to the races. I went to school in a different state because Raleigh was my problem. I'm originally from Honduras. I, I lived in Knoxville, Tennessee for a little bit, and then we moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, which is still where I live now. Um, and I went to school in, in Southern Alabama. Um, I joined a fraternity. I didn't know anybody down there. I had a blast. I got my bid at that fraternity. This fraternity is, a, I mean, it's a big fraternity. Um, and, and I was the first non-white man to get a bid at this fraternity since they were founded. And I got that solely on my drinking ability, uh, <laughs> completely. So I went down there to try and go to a different fraternity and I ended up walking by these guys and they were all sitting out on the porch just in the middle of the summertime. And, uh, and one of them stopped me and was like, hey man, what are you doing? I, like, I don't know, I was down here to hang out with these guys, but nobody's here, so I'm just gonna go back to the hotel room and find somewhere to get something to drink. And, and they're like, well, we got plenty of beer if that's what you're looking for. And I said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, so I spent the next two days with them in a, in a drunken stupor um, and, and out drinking a lot of these guys. And, and turns out it was all of like the elected officials for that fraternity that were all seniors and guys in graduate school and stuff like that. And they loved me because I could hang out with them. And uh, so I got the bid that night and I, t I took it, man. I was excited about it, you know. And uh, three months later, I got put on social probation by that fraternity for my drinking, um, <laughs> which is saying a whole lot. I mean, it's, it's really, it is. And, and, uh, and that, you know, I got put on social probation just because I ended up in the hospital. Um, and then a couple months after that, I got a DUI because I left one of the parties that we were at and I woke up from one of the parties that we were having uh, in the back of somebody's truck in the parking lot. I had wet my pants again. Uh, I had thrown up a few times and there was some warm beer sitting next to me. So I drank some of that. And then I, I decided that it would be a great idea to try and go get some food or maybe I would go home. Um, but either way, I was gonna drive there. I live maybe a hundred yards away from this fraternity house. Uh, it was four o'clock in the morning in Southern Alabama. There is nothing open. No, I mean, McDonald's isn't even open at that point. Um, and, but I think I'm gonna go get some food. I wanted Chick-fil-A. Uh, so, I, but I couldn't make my mind up on where I wanted to go. I'm just puddling along in my Ford Explorer and, uh, and I jumped to the curb and I continued to puddle along there and there was a fire hydrant sitting in, in the middle of this little grassy area, uh, just in front of these multi-million dollar game day condos for, for uh, some, some big time alumni down there. And I hit that thing square on, man. I mean, just, I hit it good. And I didn't know I hit it, so I kept trying to drive straight. Um, and it turns out that I snapped it over and it was attached to a water main for that half of the city and I knocked that, that, that water out. It was an expensive bill. Um, and uh, so, <laughs> water's going everywhere. I kind of come to, I, mind you, I'm really like in and out, in and out, in and out the whole time. A lot of this was explained to me by a couple of my fraternity brothers who watched the whole thing happen and were just kind of laughing about it. And um, I come to and I think to myself like, man, I'm stuck. Like I really can't, I still hasn't, I don't understand why I'm stuck, but I know I'm stuck. And I remember talking to somebody about it before, like, hey, if you end up hitting something like that, you can, uh, you know, get out, you can go home and you can call the police and tell them that somebody stole your car and, you know, like, you're good. You won't get a DUI. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> Key part of that is being able to get out of your car. Um, I can't do it. I'm stuck really stuck and i'm not really that like there was nothing wrong with the car i just was that drunk um and uh, and so I, I i blacked out again the police officer showed up and i remember asking him one question and then i kind of went back out it was like I, I came to and he's sitting there talking to me and he's got real not happy look on his face 
and there's water going everywhere, and, I, and I'm just like, man, why don't you have your rain jacket on, dude? Like, you're just pouring outside. <laughs> and he's like, it's not, it's not raining. You get a fire hydrant. And, uh, and, and I, I mean, it just, I don't know. I don't know why I do the things that I do. Um, by this point, I'm not very nice, though, usually. Like, it's kind of a crapshoot. I'll, I'll start off really nice, happy-go-lucky. And I'll get really mean about something or slightly emotional. Um, and then I'll go to another phase where I'll get really mean about something or really emotional about it. And then I'll pass out and then I'll wake up and I'll do the same thing over again. Um, and, and I guess when he was saying that stuff and was arresting me, I was at like, I'm really mean and really emotional phase. Um, and, uh, and I ended up in my own cell. He roughed me up a little bit too. Cause I, again, I wasn't real nice. Like I don't blame the guy um at, at all and and uh and in the state of alabama you have to spend uh so many hours in jail based on your blood alcohol level well, mine was like a point three almost four something at that point and and so i was in there for almost two and a half days i think um and and i got my own cell because i was real nice the first night that i got arrested um and the day shift was real sweet those, those people were nice they would let me come out i watched Oprah with them i got a chance to eat and snacks and stuff you know like it was good and then the night shift would be ready to come in they'd be like dude you gotta go you can't come you can't stay in here you know uh, they don't they don't like you you are not nice to them in, in every fashionable way that that one could be not nice um and uh so i would do that i got out of there the first thing i wanted to do was go to the liquor store uh i could not wait to drink. I would detox in that place a little bit and it was horrible. Uh, I did that in the hospital, you know, a couple of months before that it was terrible. Uh, I do not like detox and I don't like being hungover, so I just stay drunk. Um, and uh, my life got real small after that. I got asked to leave that school because you have to go to class to stay in college. Uh, you, it also helps if you don't knock out the city's water. Um, and, you know, I mean, it was like this, this stuff is, is expensive. And I, I didn't have any consequences from this. I didn't really have anything from the, the one in South Carolina because it was my first time getting arrested. I didn't have anything down there because we had the best lawyer in town who happened to be associated with our fraternity. So he did the whole case pro bono. The only thing I had to do was pay for the water bill, which was thousands of dollars because it was that, that you know, it was a, a freaking water main. Uh, but my dad paid for that, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm just going through this like there's nothing wrong. There's absolutely nothing wrong. I'm doing exactly what I want to do. And I moved to another state because that's the best thing to do, right? Don't go home. Move to another place and you'll figure it out. Well, I didn't figure it out at all. Well, I did. I found the people that I like to hang out with. I found the bars I like to go to found the bartenders that I liked that could do exactly what I needed to do. I had one for each day and, uh, you know, and, and they served what I needed them to serve. And I, I'm, I'm not 21 yet. I'm, I'm 19 and a half at this point and I'm drinking in these bars. I've not been carted the whole time in, in most of these places because I don't go to places like that. Those are too nice and I get way too drunk. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm drinking out of pitchers, out of a straw because I can't pick them up um, because I shake that bad when I don't have any alcohol in my system for just a few hours. Um, you know, and I got rid of all the cups in my house. I had sippy cups everywhere because uh, I was tired of chipping teeth, you know, and like you could at least sort of hold on to those because you get your finger in one of them and it wouldn't go anywhere. Um, and like, that's terrible, you know? I mean, like I look at that now and I listen to myself say that. And like at the time I thought this is great and I'm figuring things out. I'm getting smart, I'm getting intellectual about it. And I mean, I look at it now and it's, I mean, it's, that's painful. I'm not even 21 years old yet, and I'm at, I'm at that, that level, you know, and I love that about the book of Alcoholics Anonymous because it talks about that. It says that women and sometimes young, young people get here, they get to the same place that somebody could have been drinking for 20 or 30 years like that. There's no reason why that happens that way. It just happens that way. And I was absolutely one of those people. I needed Alcoholics Anonymous way before I turned 21. Um, and I ended up here during high school, and I didn't want anything to do with people here. They were old. They didn't, they didn't look like me. Cause I was 18, um, you know, and, and uh, they had lives. I didn't have anything going for me except driving a golf cart around and picking up golf balls, um, you know, and, and like, I just, I didn't want anything to do with it. Some guy asked me to go get ice cream with him. I thought he was crazy. It doesn't make any sense. Why do you want to go get ice cream with me, man? Like I ain't showered this week. I don't, I don't understand. Um, but like people showed me that they wanted to be around me. They wanted to love me. They wanted me to get this thing, you know, and I just, I wanted nothing of it. And, and when I was in Florida, 
I ended up in Alcoholics Anonymous again. This time I ended up in there because my girlfriend wasn't real happy and she had started talking to my mom, which was terrible for me. Um, it was good for her. She got to talk to somebody else and that understood how crazy I was. Um, and they convinced me to go to Alcoholics Anonymous again. And I showed up, I went to this meeting in a church. Um, people tried to hug me, it was kind of the same thing and I didn't really like it. Uh, at least when I was in high school, I went to the meeting and I was sober. When at this point I'm in Florida now, I'm not sober when I'm going to these meetings. I'm sitting in the bar all day and I'm going to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And then I'm leaving there and I'm going right back to the bar. Because AA may work for you, but it's not going to work for me. And I'm really only here because I want her to do the things that I want her to do. She's not willing to do those things unless I at least make an attempt at AA. Um, and, and that's not, that I found out that I, I still get drunk when I, I come to AA for reasons like that. Um, the last six months of my drinking were really, really small. Uh, and my world was incredibly tiny. I had a job at a rental car company um, that I stuck stickers and license plates on. There were new rental cars when, when they came in. And I would show up to work at, I don't know, like 7, 30, 8 o'clock. I would take lunch maybe by 10, even though lunch was scheduled at noon. Uh, and I would go to the bar and I would get as drunk as possible and I would come back and I would do all the work in about an hour and a half. But before that, I could not put the stickers or mess with those little screws going those back in the license plates. I hated those things because I couldn't do it. I shook so bad. And I mean, like my, I'm not just talking about my hands. Like I compulsively could not sit still. I mean, it was not fun. It's like I'm being in a seizure constantly almost without actually nodding out with that, you know? And, and, and I had to have it, just had to have it. Um, and, uh, and so then I would do that and I would leave and I'd go back to the bar, the bar that I went to every day and I'd hang out with the people that I hung out with, which were, were nice people, but they weren't normally the kind of folks that people that are 20 years old would hang out with. I finally turned 21 at this point and, uh, or just about to turn 21. I lived with the bartender because she could drive my car because I was too drunk to drive it and she had a DUI that was still pending so she didn't have a license. We lived in an apartment. Um, I lived in the apartment some of the time when I could. Other times I would just sleep in the back of my truck. In the apartment we had a beanbag, a broken TV, and a fridge full, a Jägermeister and, and Bud Light and Natty Light and, and like I was good. I was really good and that's, that's what I did every day. I would do that and, and I would just drink until I couldn't couldn't physically move anymore and I'd pass out and I'd wake up and I'd keep trying to do the same thing again. I, uh, August 13th of 2011, a buddy of mine walked into the bar. This was like a Saturday, I think, maybe Saturday or something. I don't know, it was a weekend. I wasn't working, so we, I don't know what day of the week it was because I may not have just gone to work that day. Um, I grew up across the street from him. He had been sober for about six months. He had gone to a treatment center in Greensboro um, and for other stuff, he was sober through NA, but he, nonetheless, he had still been sober and, and had a sponsor and was working a program at that point. And it actually got to a point where he could start working with other guys. And he walks in and he found me and his mom was there with him. They had come in to pick up some wings because uh, they were just gonna go back to the house and eat. I mean, you know, like a, a family would, right? I saw those two, I, I lost it. I broke down. I couldn't, I just, I don't know what it was. There was just something about me that I just, it was okay if I was drinking around all the people that I usually do, but when somebody that had saw me since I was a little kid and had known me that whole time saw me the way that I was, I wasn't really excited about it and, uh, and I lost it. And he convinced me to come back home with him that night and to not drink. I didn't sleep at all. I broke some glasses in their house trying to drink some water. I sweat through the mattress. Um, and uh, the next morning, about 8, 30, 9 o'clock, I convinced him to take me to that bartender's house because I needed to get my truck. And I wanted to have some drinks real, real bad. And I got to that house. I come piling through the door. They're still asleep and, and passed out. And I went to the fridge. I got that drink and I, I started drinking and I got so deathly ill. I mean, it was a pretty common occurrence for me to, to throw up in the morning or dry heat consistently and sometimes throw up blood and stuff like that. But at, like for some reason, this particular morning was unusually rough. Uh, I almost ripped that toilet off the ground. I was shaking so bad trying to do that and I could not get anything down. I did that for about an hour until they all woke up and it was time to go to the bar. And we went to the bar and I went behind that bar and I grabbed a bottle and I went into that bathroom. 
which had not been cleaned in a long time and it was a concrete dirty old nasty floor and i laid around that toilet just hugging it doing the same thing trying to get some liquor down and i finally got enough now that i could get up and i could do a little bit but before i left that bathroom i remember asking god to help me because i needed something i didn't really care what it was but i wanted something to change um you know I, real real bad the uh during that time frame one of the girls that was at that bar consistently had been convincing me to go to some AA meetings it was last call and carry at, at the triangle Alano club and and i would i would tell the bartender man like i'm i'm going to aa hold my tab open i'll be back in a little bit um and he would do it no no problem like i was just like the resident drunk and all these people in there are freaking 60 70 years old 50 years old They've been doing this a lot longer than me, and I'm 21 in a few months, and I, I can't I can't hold anything together. Um, I uh, I had an intervention later that day at my parents' house. Um, I hated the idea of that. I knew what it was. I see the TV show. They had the board up. Everybody had written a damn letter and stuff. I was like, I don't really care. I want to go wherever it is that you guys want to send me. I just want to go right now. I don't want to listen to what you guys have to say. They made me sit down. They made me go through that whole process. It was terrible. Everybody got emotional. There was beer waiting for me at the end of it, so I stayed for a little bit. Um, and uh, and we went to that treatment center. I got to that treatment center. I didn't have shoes on. I really had not showered in, in several days. I, that's kind of a thing. I don't I don't like shoes when I'm drinking. Um, I don't really like clothes when I'm drinking, in all honesty. Like, I just kind of meander around wherever it is that I go. And if I fall in some bushes, then I, that's where I'm sleeping, you know. And, and if I fall in the median, then that's where I'm sleeping. Like, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, and now I work at a, at a high-end men's clothing store and I get to wear stuff like this all the time and I have more shoes than I know what to do with, you know, and like, <laughs> it's just weird what happens, right? If I come in here and I take some suggestions and things change, I have no idea where my life is going to take me. Um, and I ended up in that treatment center and I remember getting there and I was a little emotional about it and, and uh, man, I got there and I'm thinking to myself, I, I overshot the mark. I should go home. I don't have a drinking problem. I'm good. That's nuts. That is the definition of insanity I found out. I found out. So people convinced me to walk in there and I did that and it was, I'm glad that they did. I, I did everything that that treatment center asked me to do except stay in Greensboro um, and, and go to a halfway house there. I decided that it was gonna be safer for me to go home and stay with my parents because they do not have a drinking problem um, and they were willing to let me come and stay with them as long as I tried to stay sober or as long as I stayed sober. Um, and uh, so that's what I did. I went to a meeting the day that I got out of that treatment center. It was Carrie Young Peoples at the Triangle Alano Club in Cary. Uh, that was my home group for the first year and a half. Um, I met my sponsor there. Uh, he, uh, you know, everybody passes in meeting sheets around sometimes and, and they write numbers down on there for the new people. And, and I introduced myself in that meeting. I said I was new and I was afraid. I didn't know what, I was, what was going on. And, and uh, I had gone to that meeting before drunk and there were these guys that used to corner me every freaking meeting and ask me if I was ready to stop drinking and I would tell them yes just so they would shut up and leave and then I would go back to the bar and, and these guys recognized me but I didn't really recognize them and they introduced me to a bunch of people and I got some phone numbers and and, uh, and they got my phone number which I have found is one of the most crucial things that I can do to try and help a newcomer as well because if they're like me they don't call right I don't have any problems or you're, you're busy I don't want to interrupt your day. Um, so I'm not going to call, you know, and, and one of those guys that got my phone number called me the next day. Turns out that's all I really ever wanted was somebody to call me to show me that my life mattered to them. Right. Because up until that point, I would, did not hang around people like that. I only hung around people that wanted something for me when I had it. Um, and, and, and they didn't want anything to do with me when I didn't have anything for them. Uh, they, they really didn't. And um, I thought they were my best friends. You know, again, I'm, I'm really confused uh, about a lot of things. And uh, I worked up the nerve to ask that man to sponsor me. He said he would do it temporarily because I didn't do a real good job of staying sober up until that point. I was a little pissed off about the whole situation, but I still asked him to sponsor me. Turns out that man is my best friend now. Um, he uh, knows everything about me. I got a chance to meet his wedding. He called, he's got a new baby girl. Man, she's adorable. She, she is something special. Um, and she's got these deep brown eyes, man, that just look right through you, right? And, and I got to hold her at two weeks sober, and, and I, I get to be Uncle Nate. I'm not related to that, to that little girl, but I get to be Uncle Nate because I, I took his suggestions, and I let that man continue to guide and direct me through any situation that happens in my life. Um, 
And uh, he told me from the very beginning that it's not his job. Like, he's not here to keep me sober. He's here to carry the message that was carried to him. And if I want to do what he did, then I might have a shot at this thing. But I have to do it. Um, and that's still his answer to me today. Uh, when, when I call him and things are going wrong and I don't know what direction is up and what direction is down and my life is out of control. And he's like, well, you know, I got a little experience in that. He shares it with me and then he tells me that I'm going to do whatever it is that I want to do. So I can do that and I, he, I can call him later and let him know how it went, uh, which frustrates me to death because I, I kind of want somebody to tell me what to do. But he does not tell me what to do. He just makes suggestions based on his own experience. If he doesn't have that experience, and he puts me in contact with somebody that does. right? And he took me through the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, we read it word for word, and we did exactly what it said when it said to do it. Um, and and I, I had a spiritual experience and a spiritual awakening through that process. And the obsession to drink went away from me. Um, and and uh, I have truly found that that spiritual awakening and that spiritual experience or spiritual experiences that I continue to have in Alcoholics Anonymous can help me in any situation that I encounter in life. Um, any situation like the one that happened on Thanksgiving Day this past year. I cannot tell you how pain I still have nightmares sitting there holding holding my i mean she's like a second mom to me and i can i can't i can't comfort her enough right we're sitting in the room with her dead son whose heart exploded and he's just i mean it's like it it drives me nuts sometimes right but i i got a chance to be there for her when nobody else could be here there for her and and then i got a chance to be a part of alcoholics anonymous later that night and go to my home group and set up and share that meeting because that's what i was taught how to do my sponsor picked me up from day one and showed me how to do every single one of those things. He would trick me into going to treatment centers and stuff like that. And I would get real upset about him afterwards because he gave the lady my number. So then she started calling me to go pick people up. And I didn't want to waste my gas money to go up there and do that. And what if they steal something out of my car? You know, like I was real upset about that kind of stuff. Turns out that was the greatest time that I ever had to sit in those cars with those guys. We went to those meetings. I mean, it was fantastic, right? Because it's not about me. It's about them and it's about all of you you know i don't know some people learn different things when they come here some people have a lot of different experiences but the 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 idea of working through the steps for that same common goal of that that relief uh being relieved of that drinking obsession right we're all here for the same reason with that uh and that's a miracle that there's no one way to do it right like we there's there's one outline so to speak but there's no one way that somebody has to experience it we all get our own unique experience in that. And that has absolutely been the case with the guys that I get a chance to sponsor. Every single one of those guys is different in their own unique way. And uh, some of them can't get this thing right now for, for whatever reason. And some of them get it right away. I don't know, you know. All I know is, is that I'm supposed to be here, period. Because if I'm not here, then AA doesn't get a chance to be here, so to speak. You know, I mean, if I'm literally the last person left, if I don't show up, then somebody doesn't get a meeting. That's a, that's a scary thought. Because there's a lot of people that need this thing. I needed it really, really bad, and I needed people to be here consistently so that they could show me some love when I would come in here even though I wasn't ready to do anything. Um, and uh, I got a chance to go to some meetings in different countries. I got a chance to go to some meetings in different languages. I tell you, if you ever want to feel the presence of God in a meeting, go to one in a different language. It is fantastic because you can feel it. I mean, it's scary how much you can feel it. Um, and, and I, you know, again, you don't know what they're saying unless you, I guess if you speak that language, you would, but you know, like I didn't know what they were saying. It was in French, no idea what they were saying, but some guys came up and they spoke some broken English to me and I had a good time with them and they, they made sure that I felt, I was felt welcome during that. And, and it was amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing to be a part of that kind of stuff. Um, AA is everywhere. I thought it was just in Cary at first. And then I thought it was in Raleigh. Come to find out is literally everywhere. And, and that is really cool because now when I travel anywhere, I get a chance to go to an AA meeting and meet a whole bunch of new people. And that is fantastic because when I walk into that room of Alcoholics Anonymous, man, I am at home and I love home. I, I, I just I feel so a part of Alcoholics Anonymous no matter where I go. And, it, and it's amazing. Um, and, and all I had to do was ask somebody for help at the beginning. That's it. Right. I got well, I got to before that I got to have a drinking problem. Otherwise, there's not a whole lot of reason for me to be here, right? <laughs> but if I've got that drinking problem and then I come in here and I ask somebody for help, then, I, then I'm in. There's nothing else that i got to do. And if I go back out because I'm not willing to take those suggestions for a while, I can come back 
and nobody's going to tell me I can't come back here. You know, I've watched some people try and do that in some cases. I don't think that's right. You know, I've got a guy that I've sponsored for the last four years. He cannot get more than 60 days. He just can't do it. It breaks my heart. I mean, it sucks. He's in a treatment center right now. You know, he called me from there again. We just finished working his fifth step finally. I was excited about that. He couldn't, couldn't, I don't know what it was. He just couldn't handle it, I guess. You know, but that may have saved my life too. When my grandmother passed away, I found that out on April 1st. April 2nd, he called me at 6.30 in the morning, right after I got off my knees asking God for something to do because I was going to go crazy. I just lost the woman that I loved that much. You know, he said, man, I'm in Winston-Salem. I'm drunk. I don't know what to do. I'm running away from something. Can you come get me? I want to go to treatment. Yeah, I'll come get you. I don't have anything else to do today. So that's what I did. You know, I spent the whole day with him. Alcoholics Anonymous always shows up for me, whether I mean it to or not. Right. All I have to do is listen and then take that opportunity when it's in front of me. Um, and and I, I don't know why I get a chance to do this. And some people do not. But I'm very grateful that I got the chance to be here tonight. I'm very grateful that I got the chance to be a part of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I really hope that somebody got something out of what I said tonight. Um, it meant the world to me that Chad asked me to come down here and do this. And, and I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it's just it's a debt I can never repay, but I'm going to try. And, and I don't want to go anywhere, you know, and I don't know everything. And I know that I don't know everything. And in all honesty, that's kind of a good thing for somebody like me, because if I knew everything, I wouldn't have a reason to be here. That's a scary thought, because I told you all what I'm like when I'm not here. I'm a mess. I mean, an absolute mess. <laughs> Right. So I've always got something to learn, which means I always have a place to go. And that's AA. Thank you very much for letting me share.